Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 236 video cast podcast for the week ending April 25th, 2024. A lot of great stuff to cover today, so we're going to get right down to it. Uh, not a lot of family updates. Uh, Annabelle had a tiny fracture on her finger, so she's taking a break. Uh, got a little ding at water polo, and uh, no real meets or competitions. Those are coming up. I got out over the weekend to play a little golf here in Connecticut, which is always fun. And um, now on to the media. Want to thank David Lynn for having me on the David Lynn Report. This was a comprehensive uh, interview. Always get tremendous feedback from David's interviews because he asks the right questions and he digs in deep. So we're going to listen in now. We're, we're on the cusp of a regime change, David, as it relates to global coordinated central bank policy. Namely, during COVID, Bank of Japan has been the global liquidity provider by printing unlimited yen and using that money to not only buy JGBs and Japanese equities, but actually global sovereign bonds and global equities as well. Uh, they have now stopped their yield curve control. And in the context of that global coordinated central bank policy, both the ECB and the Fed know that they have to lift the torch so as to avoid a massive liquidity shock. Thomas Hayes returns to the show. He is a managing member of Great Hill Capital, and he was on the show three months ago calling for stock markets to grind higher. He made the correct call then. Check out our interview in the link down below. We're up here to see what he said in January. Now things are starting to cool off a bit, so Thomas has this updated view for us today. What's going to happen next? Find out and stay tuned. First, a shout out to our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below or if you're watching this on a TV, scan the QR code right here to get started. Thomas, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here, David. Three months ago, you were on. You were calling for the markets to continue going up, and it has. But now we've seen a bit of a reprieve, about a 5% correction from the top uh, from a couple of weeks ago. What's going on right now? Yeah, I you know about a month, uh, four or five weeks ago on our public appearances, we, as you know, appear on many, many different stations. Uh, started talking about a three to eight percent pullback in the markets, and we set up two hedges that we discussed publicly. One was we did put spreads on the S and P five hundred, uh, which was one percent of our equity capital expected value of five x, and we did put spreads on the semiconductor index, uh, also one percent of equity capital, and we stayed long in the portfolio, ninety eight percent long with those two hedges. Uh, the semiconductor index now, uh, you know, peak to trough has dropped 17%, which uh, most people aren't really talking about, although a few people felt it on Friday. So that's been a very successful tactical short and hedge for us. Uh, and the S&P is down 6% peak to trough. We did take off some of that last week on the S&P side, the semiconductor side. We remain short or tactically hedged. Uh, and we rolled that into long TLT, long bonds, which means we think that the rally in yields is coming or at or near an end. If you're, I guess, long on bonds and expect yields to fall, are you then expecting the Fed to pivot anytime soon? Is that based on uh, a reduction in the short term uh, or short end of the curve? It's not predicated on a, an imminent cut. Uh, however, I do think that it would not be outside the realm of possibility to see the first cut sometime this summer. I think the air aspect that many market participants have failed to notice or are not paying attention to at the moment was something that was uh, disclosed in the Fed minutes about a week and a half ago, which was that consensus was to taper the taper starting quote unquote soon. And this is a big deal because currently you have about $95 billion of bonds uh, rolling off in the market every single month and not being replaced. So you have no treasury bid in the, in the market uh, from the Fed. As a result, the Fed balance sheet has come down uh, modestly, but, but meaningfully over the last year and a half since they started quantitative tightening. Moving forward, 
if you've got 60 billion of treasuries and 35 billion of mortgage-backed securities, their focus is to at least uh, start replacing half of the treasury roll-off, which means they're going to be in the market buying 30, 40 billion dollars of treasuries a month. Now, you can call that whatever you want, but the, the fact of the matter is there's going to be a new buyer in town, and that is a buyer of size, if you remember the size of historical quantitative easings, uh, and that is going to create a, bond, a bid for bonds that no one is really focused on at the moment. And as a matter of fact, the reason we say it's time to fade the spike in yields, the counter trend move in yields, um, uh, is, is because that is expected to happen sometime in May by those in the know. And it's been alluded to both in their minutes and by several uh, prominent sell side uh, analysts. If yields will fall, Thomas, are you expecting inflation to continue falling alongside with it? Well, inflation, you know, has really been impacted by uh, insurance premiums, which are abnormally high. And uh, I've spoken to people in the industry and, and basically what you're seeing, I said, well, you know, why are they so high? Because I've seen soft cycles that last longer than everyone expects. I've seen hard, price hardening cycles that last longer than people expect. And the issue was during COVID, it was so hard to get in, in the case of auto, auto parts, auto repairs done. Uh, and then because it took so long and it cost so much, they would have to provide rental cars and there was a, a small supply of rental cars. So the cost to the insurance company when someone filed a claim were astronomical. And we're now working through the tail end of that. So I do believe that that heavy weighting uh, of, of insurance premiums is going to start to mitigate, at least stop going up and, and probably in the next few quarters start coming down. That's going to have a dramatic impact. And then owner's equivalent rent, we all know that's been a lag. Uh, indicator. If you look at Zillow and other uh, rental indicators, that should start. It's it's taken longer than expected. So I do think that inflation uh, a has moderated quite a bit, and b uh, continues to moderate uh, prospectively. In one of your recent hedge fund tips reports, and I'll encourage everyone to check out hedge fund tips down below. Um, you have a chart showing the net percentage of fund uh, manager survey um, investors who expect global profit growth to continue improving. And it's in the positive and that 20% of FMS investors think profits will improve in the next 12 months. How does this translate to sentiment in risk assets, do you think? Yeah, so it, it had been, sentiment had been for uh, most of the rally. And you know, we've been bullish, not just since last, uh, three months ago, but since October, 2022. And then when everyone got bearish in March of 2023, we were bullish. And then everyone got bearish again in October of 2023. We were bullish. Uh, the first tactical short we put on over that period has been in the last five weeks. Uh, and as I said, we've kept the semiconductor one on. We think there's a little more work to do there. Um, so as it relates to sentiment, what many headlines have been saying is managers are the most bullish since January 2022 which implies what happened in February 2022, we started a big correction, 25% correction in the S&P 500. And the error in that headline and that thinking is it's, it's trapped in what we call recency bias, taking the most recent event and extrapolating forward in perpetuity. And what it doesn't have is a sample side size worth exploring, which would be that the sentiment also reached these elevated levels in 2013, after the 2011 and 2012 European debt crisis, and the rally, equity rally continued for another year and a half. And the sentiment uh, that they refer to as a reason for a crash also reached these levels in late 2009, and the rally lasted for another year and a half. So uh, we are, while, while we, we had been cautious starting five weeks ago, and it took longer than we expected, we thought it would be imminent in late February, early March to get this pullback that we've now seen. It took five or six weeks, um, but we're, get, you know, we're finding, we buy individual companies, we run a concentrated portfolio. We're finding things that we want to put money to work right now, even if we're not bottom tip ticking the indices. So are we saying, you know, the correction's over by all the indices? No. Are we saying that these, this correction in uh, indices has created some new crop of incredible opportunities to put money to work today, even if the market hasn't yet bottomed? 
Uh, that is what we are saying. Well, speaking of sectors, you wrote in uh, another report on hedge fund tips that the West, the Fed and ECB um, have stopped hiking and will likely move to ease in the coming months. You've you've said this already. Um, number th- Point number three, this will help interest rate sensitive stocks and bonds, EM equities, small caps, banks, REITs, utilities, et cetera. Are these the sectors you're mostly concentrated in? Uh, these are areas that we're putting new money to work. We're we're on the cusp of a regime change, David, as it relates to global coordinated central bank policy. Namely, during COVID, Bank of Japan has been the global liquidity provider by printing unlimited yen and using that money to not only buy JGBs and Japanese equities, but actually global sovereign bonds and global equities as well. Uh, they have now stopped their yield curve control they have now started, uh, albeit modest, magnitude is less important than direction, started hiking and being more restrictive. And in the context of that global coordinated central bank policy, both the ECB and the Fed know that they have to lift the torch so as to avoid a massive liquidity shock. Uh, and they will do that. And I think it will be started by the Fed in May with a tapering of the taper, uh, i.e. being back in the market buying bonds, although they'll call it something else. Uh, i.e. reinvesting those that have rolled off. And the ECB probably looks uh, closer to cutting than the Fed, maybe simultaneously, but both soon in in months, not years, for sure. Um, If the BOJ stops becoming the provider of global liquidity, so to speak, I wonder how that directly translates to uh, liquidity here in the U.S. and in North America. Yeah, and and I think that's why you're going to see the Fed back in the market buying, you know, r- right now they're rolling off $95 billion a month in bonds, 60 treasuries, 35 mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and if they announce in May, uh, they'll be back buying 30, 40 billion a month. That's a tremendous amount of liquidity, half a trillion dollars a year. Uh, and to your point and the question you asked earlier, the biggest beneficiaries will be the ones left for dead during that period where both the all of the West, the Fed and the ECB, were aggressively restrictive trying to cross inflation, which they've largely succeeded. Uh, emerging market equities, I think, are going to get a bid that no one expects. I, I think that's going to help emerging market equities. It's going to help China. We're seeing signs of recovery in China. Finally, it's taken longer than everyone expected, uh, or certainly longer than I've expected. Uh, small caps will be a major beneficiary. Banks were already seeing. Uh, REITs, utilities, all of that. You know, The other thing that the Fed is cognizant of is the impact of the ability for people to refinance and the ability for people to buy homes. Uh, and, uh, and they also have the dual mandate of employment as well as inflation. So yes, they want more data, but, but I don't think they have as much of a fuse as they think they have to wait and wait and wait for data, which is why I think you're going to see them use their other tool, which is actually more significant than a 25 basis point cut, which is actually, you know, creating 30, 40 billion dollars a month of new liquidity as a buyer in 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 the bond market. Um, just going back to sentiment as it relates to what you just talked about, I'm looking at two things. The VIX has been spiking, and the yeah, credit spreads have slightly widened. The Bank of America ICE high yield option adjusted spread is slightly ticking up um, from earlier this April. Are these two coincident indicators or leading indicators for anything? Uh, I think they're more coincident. Certainly in the terms of the VIX, it's coincident. In terms of uh, high yield spreads, you always want to keep an eye on that. Uh, This is probably more of when you see heart attacks like you saw in 2020, we had the recession. Then in 2022, by the way, we had a, a technical recession, first two quarters, negative GDP growth, which is why we got so bullish in October of 2022. And I said, everyone's waiting for the recession that's already happened. (laughs) Um, And and that's persisted. It's unlikely that you're going to see three recessions in six years. You know, on balance, you see, you know, one every four to seven years, somewhere in that neighborhood. And the fact that we're two for four years uh, tells me this this has a longer way to go. This is a normal healthy pullback. This six uh, percent in the S and P peak to trough, eight percent in the Nasdaq, seventeen percent in semiconductors, and I think it's closer to the end than the beginning. Uh, and we're seeing it in a, in a lot of individual names, but the indices might might show a, a hair more pain before inflecting. Uh, since we spoke in January, a few things have moved dramatically. The first is oil, which I'll ask you to comment on. Let's talk about energy. Uh, are you keeping tabs on how energy is affecting the rest of the broad markets? 
I am. Uh, you know, we have expressed our energy view through a company that Jerry Jones owns about two thirds of. He's the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and he recently put another hundred million into Comstock Resources, which has a tremendous amount of uh, natural gas in the Haynesville area, uh, which is access to export uh, out of the Gulf. So we like that. As far as individual energy companies, and we've known each other for a long time now, if you recall in 2020, we were very aggressive buying uh, integrated uh, energy companies and E&P companies. We took a lot of those off uh, after they had the huge run into uh, 2021 and 2022. We haven't found uh, a level of value and margin of safety that's attractive to us. We do think the secular trend is up. Uh, we do think uh, uh, emerging market demand is going to start to uh, accelerate, uh, but there could be some factors that uh, put more supply back on the, mar- on the market over the next uh, 12 months if there are political changes, if there's geopolitical de-escalation. So uh, we think the best way to play the increasing energy demand, both from AI, EV, all the you know population growth, et cetera, is actually to play it through natural gas, which is which is the most hated at the moment. But how significant is the energy price to the rest of the index? I've heard this narrative, and please comment on it if you can, that should energy break out due to geopolitical shocks or supply shocks, like you've mentioned, first of all, it may it may put the recession um, into the economy faster than some may anticipate. It may force the Fed to move faster than anticipate and ultimately have dramatic impacts on the stock markets themselves. What do you think? I think if it's geopolitical, it's short-lived. And I think that if it's uh, secular demand, um, <clears throat> I think there will be a political will to increase production and make it easier and easier for us to tap the deposits that we have. Uh, I, I think that if you see political changes as well, I think the the relationship with OPEC could potentially be different moving forward. So. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't, su- it wouldn't surprise me to see continued strength, but we also are, uh, through a period of seasonal strength where you normally see a bid post February into about now, uh, in anticipation of the summer driving season. And then it kind of tails off through August. So, uh, I, I, I wouldn't make any new energy bets, big energy bets, other than playing uh, the the one expression that we have at these levels we like in terms of natural gas. And that's kind of a different framework to think about uh, how how to express it. And we're buying it at such a discount to its liquidation value that our margin of safety is great, irrespective of the price. Okay. And the other one I wanted to bring to your attention is gold, as you know, run up to new all-time highs, surpassing $2,400 at one point. Thomas, are you concerned about what this signals? Well, not so much the price run itself, but is it signaling the um, risk off soon? Is it signaling heightened geopolitical pressure? Is it signaling some sort of credit event? I think it's signaling more. You know, we started this this uh, this call talking about it's time to fade the spike in yields and the spike in the U.S. dollar. And I think that uh, the deficits that we're running, debt to GDP greater than 120%, I think gold is telling us uh, that we need to get our fiscal house in order. And the irony uh, about that, David, is the last time we had debt to GDP levels this pronounced, i.e. 120% plus, uh, was post-World War II, 1948. And by 1956, they took the debt to GDP ratio down from 120% down to 63%. How did they do that? They let inflation run a little bit up hotter above trend, three to 5%, like most governments historically have done to pay off their debts, they inflated away. Uh, now, how do you do that? And yet at the same time, pin inflation expectations so people don't start to behave in a way that accelerates inflation is you keep talking about this uh, uh, ethereal uh, 2% inflation target, which will never happen. You continue to pin expectations down. You look at five-year break-evens, they're being very effective with their hawkish talk, but they know if we're going to have some type of uh, normalization of debt to GDP after borrowing so much money with re- regard to COVID and its aftermaths, 
they are going to have to run inflation a little bit above trend and uh, at the same time main, maintain liquidity. They'll do a lot of it through the balance sheet. And as it relates to cuts, I think the, the, the magic, the name of the game with cuts is the earlier they move, the less they'll have to do. If they went with one cut this summer, they might be one and done or one or one to two and done. If they wait till after the election, I think it's going to be problematic. And I think they're going to wind up having to do a lot more than they anticipated. And there's going to be a lot more pain to employment. So uh, I'm optimistic they'll continue to talk hawkish. They'll get a cut in before the election. They will start uh, providing $40 billion a month of liquidity in the bond market to, to compress yields. People will be able to refinance. Liquidity will be there. And, uh, and, and as far as commercial, they'll work through with a natural extend and pretend. Okay. Um, that's great. So finally, I'd like to ask you about your um, positioning uh, long-term and medium-term. Ultimately, you haven't changed your tactical outlook since last we spoke, right? In March, uh, in uh, January, rather. Because I see in uh, in your hedge fund notes, uh, hedge fund tips notes, as of the 18th of April, you wrote that we continue to be hedged and long. Um, yep. The answer is uh, there's been a you know the odds favor a short term pullback, which we're getting, but none of our active positions are at or above fairly fully valued, and so we ignore the short term noise. So exactly, exactly. So we were able to benefit from this short term volatility with those two tactical hedges because they were asymmetric bets. Uh, putting at risk uh, 2% of equity capital with a expected value of over 5x each. So we could dampen volatility, create some excess capital. And now we're looking for opportunities to deploy in coming weeks. Uh, there are quite a number of great companies now that have been marked down to levels where they're uh, absolute no-brainers moving forward. So uh, we like the environment. We're constructive. It doesn't preclude uh, you know, a little further softening in any of these indices. Uh, but there's enough to do now constructively into year end that uh, that we would be starting to uh, deploy money, not in indices, but in individual names. Thank you very much. All right, Thomas, where can we learn more about you? Uh, follow your work. And uh, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, on uh, Twitter, we have the handle is at hedge fund tips on Instagram. We just set up a new handle at official hedge fund tips. That's a little bit more personalized that uh, people are liking that. And TikTok is at official hedge fund tips. That's been a big one for us. Uh, and then the website, of course, hedgefundtips.com. And I uh, appreciate being on with you as always. I appreciate you being on. Uh, have you been getting bots on Instagram? Is that why you have to use the official uh, official handle <laughs> and person? Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we we we've um, yeah, kind of got some coaching that uh, you know different content works in different platforms. So we. We try to be a little bit more personal and share some pictures on the golf course and uh, as well as some great market stuff as well. Okay. Well, yeah, you write some great analysis on hedge fund tips. We don't have time to go over everything you've written in the last week, but I do encourage people to check it out. We'll put the links down in the description below. Thank you very much again for coming on the show. We'll speak to you again soon, Thomas. Thanks again, David. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we're back. And then I was on Channel News Asia CNA in Singapore, which is basically like the BBC for Singapore, the main station. I uh, want to thank Marianne Star Inike, Audrey Tay, and the host Liz Neo for having on. We'll tune in here. And Thomas Hayes, a chairman and managing member at Great Hill Capital, joins us for more. And Thomas, this week in markets is a major test of the bull run in equities. And based on earnings out so far, especially as also we're seeing the S&P 500 uh, recording its best back-to-back -back rally in months, how do you personally think it's faring? Well, Liz, thanks for having me. Uh, we did have a technical bounce here. The S&P fell 6% peak to trough. The NASDAQ fell 8% peak to trough. Semiconductors fell 17% peak to trough. So we were due for a technical bounce. Now the market is waiting to see how does the Magnificent 7 do? So you saw Tesla after hours. Uh, it, the, the results couldn't have been worse. <laughs> it's basically what it comes down to. 9% down on revenues, 50% down on earnings. But like Elon Musk always does, he pulled a rabbit out of the hat. And he said, oh, by the way, we're going to have that in inexpensive car coming next year, which probably means the year after. But it was enough to get the short sellers to cover after market hours. We'll see if we get follow through moving forward. 
Yeah, this reaction, you know, uh, because of what Elon Musk has said, I mean, is this just an uh, immediate term reaction or do you think this is enough to sort of undo all the damage Tesla has taken so far this year? I mean, year to date is down 40 percent. And as you said, Elon Musk says next year he really means 2026. Exactly. You never want to bet against Elon Musk, but you also never want to bet, bet against his ability to promote his stock. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing right now. Certainly in the long term, I would never bet against him. And, uh, you know, as far as the general markets, in addition to that technical bounce, we did see two important data points that you referenced, which was the manufacturing PMI and the services PMI missed expectations. And what that meant was that this counter trend rally with yields spiking and the dollar spiking, which had everyone nervous about markets in recent weeks, may be, be coming to or nearing an end because what we saw was yields were more subdued today. And it may mean if we are, in fact, slowing in the economy a little bit, the Fed will, in fact, be able to move ahead with one or two cuts this year. Yeah. And looking at how yields are moving, um, your expectations on whether that is actually going to happen. I mean, there's lots of chatter, um, even saying that those cuts could come next year, uh, given that the trajectory and, and where yields are headed. Uh, how likely is the cuts happening, are the cuts happening this year? Yeah, I do think uh, if we continue to see that type of data, we will see one or two cuts this year. But the big news that very few people are focused on, Liz, is in the Fed minutes in the, in the last week or so, they alluded to tapering the taper, meaning they've been allowing $90 billion of bonds to roll off every single month, creating a lot of supply and not reinvesting that money. What the Fed has signaled is they want to cut that in half soon, which means they're going to start reinvesting about 30 to $45 billion a month in treasuries, which is going to create new demand for treasuries, which should increase the price of treasuries and decrease yields. And that's why I think uh, maybe in the next few days or certainly the next couple of weeks, we may be getting closer to the end of the rise in yields and maybe bonds start to find a bid, which is going to affect a number of different sectors in the stock market that have been left behind. Yeah. And looking at how this could affect the stock market um, on top of what's happening with treasuries, um, and also combined with the fact that we haven't really seen a lot more results from those big tech names. Um, are you expecting this to give markets a further boost? Uh, especially, are you expecting to see those big tech names extend their positive uh, performance there? There's an estimate there from Bloomberg saying that Max 7 names, uh, their forecast to rise in 38% in Q1 from a year ago. And how would you position in tech? Yeah, I do think that the Magnificent Seven earnings are going to come in in line or slightly better. You know, estimates for the quarter overall have been brought down from 5.7% earnings growth to just 3.4% earnings growth. So the bar is lower, which enables companies to step over it. They don't have to jump over it. And I do think when, when Meta reports uh, tomorrow and then Microsoft and Alphabet the day after, I do think we're going to see positive results and positive guidance. Uh, which should be short-term supportive for the market. But the real story is going to be, does the Fed actually start to cut back on the taper? And do does that first cut look like it's going to happen potentially over the summer or in the fall, in which case uh, that's when the market will find its footing? It may not be immediately, but it could be in coming weeks. Yeah, indeed. So that is a big question out there. And combined with geopolitical con conditions, uh, those concerns there, especially what's happening in the Middle East, uh, how do you hedge amid all of this um, volatility, this uncertainty? Yeah, so we had uh, three hedges, uh, derivative hedges. We're, we're 97, 98% long in our portfolio, but we had uh, three hedges. Number one, we had a hedge on the S&P 500 put spreads. We, had a, we still have a full hedge on semiconductors, which has been very good for us in the market, if not uh, in, it could be as early as May that they'll be back uh, reinvesting some of those rolled off proceeds from their bond portfolio, which is going to uh, cause bonds to appreciate and yields to compress. So we went long the TLT, which is longer dated treasuries. All right, Thomas, appreciate your time this morning. Thomas Hayes, there, chairman and managing member at Great Hill Capital.
and we're back. So that gives you a broad overview of how we're thinking about things right now. Cuts right to the chase. Also want to thank Chibuke Ogu for having me in his Reuters article earlier in the week. And our quote of the week is from Warren Buffett. The stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. We're going to go through a number of names we've talked about on the podcast in recent months and update you on some progress. But first, I want to take a moment, and I haven't done this in a while, to really thank all of the existing uh, clients who have been with me now for years, uh, newer clients, a year or two years, and the brand new clients who just came in for uh, the last couple of quarters and uh, that are coming in now. We are closing out our raise for small accounts, one million and above on Saturday, the end of this week. We opened it up uh, two Thursdays ago. This will be it for the small account raise for Q2. We will revisit in Q3 if we're opening up for the smaller accounts. And as always, the larger accounts of five and 10 million can come in for bespoke service at their convenience. Uh, so I just wanna run through this list. Uh, most of them like privacy, but I uh, just wanna know that I'm thinking of you and uh, appreciative and grateful. Rob S, Chris S, Chris K, Brian J, Woody P, Frank S, Craig P, Sherry P, Srini P, Lakshmi, uh, Lakshmi J, Seema G, Sandeep G, Steve D, Dean J, James T, Lorraine T, Steve C, Pat L, John L, Paul S, Mike, uh, and the newest ones, uh, Micah A, Abhishek A, and a partnership who, a uh, very large partnership coming in who likes to remain uh, anonymous. So we'll just call them PMAC. Uh, you know who you are, the large partnership of four. Uh, grateful to have you on board as well. And um, so in the context of this Warren Buffett quote, uh, what's important about it is Let's take a look at some of the names and uh, groups that we've discussed in recent weeks and months. And you should also be grateful, by the way, to that large list of incredible investors that are with me as money management clients because they functionally underwrite the uh, weekly podcast video cast. This is predominantly a way for me to talk to them about how I'm thinking about markets some of our positions, and then they can log into their own accounts and see which ones we have on, which ones we don't have on, how we size them, the conviction levels based on the weightings and the timing and all of that other stuff that they get to benefit from as clients. Uh, but it also benefits you because it's an effective way uh, for me to communicate to everyone all at once. And we're very grateful for clients and non-clients alike. Many of you have been loyal viewers for a year, two years, three years, four years. We're on episode 236. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. So look at biotech here. So we've had this monster run, almost a double there at the end of last year into early this year. It's pulling back. It has a tendency to do that every time it comes out of these large uh, sideways consolidations, pulls back before a next par parabolic move, pulls back before a parabolic move. But I, I do this zooming out and I consistently try to zoom out because on days like this, when the market's down, people think that it's the end of the world and it's really just the beginning. Uh, and by the way, the end of the world only comes once. And if it does come, uh, these charts and podcasts are gonna be the last thing you are thinking about. So not to worry. Uh, VF Corp again, it's been weak. You know, a lot of these sometimes it's just no news. You know, the interim between, especially with new CEOs, they can't say anything for three, four months uh, between uh, three months between earnings calls and the market just sits and waits. And in the absence of news, it just goes sideways. It's very common. This is very common bottoming process like you saw in the 2000. Uh, 2009 period, they they spike down, then they then they go up. People get optimistic, and then they go back and retest uh, before they start to move again. We did cover the channel checks three weeks ago on Vans. It's looking constructive. I've been to a couple stores up here in Connecticut. I'm feeling better after talking with some of the workers. So um, so we're excited about that one. Stanley Black and Decker, same story. Uh, putting in that base, working higher highs, higher lows. That's constructive. Uh, SMTC, that's a small semi-play. 
uh, that we bought in the hole down here in the teens. Now it's 30 and change. So that one, I think it's going to work higher over time. Very similar to Intel, uh, although Intel moves so fast and so much that we took off two thirds at the end of last year from 25 to 48. And now with the third that we kept, the house is money. Uh, we may wind up making that a bigger position again if, if uh, they're going to report tonight. So hopefully the, re the results are bad and uh, we may revisit uh, making it a full position at these lower levels if we get an opportunity. Uh, and then again, we may not. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll take a look at earnings, see how things settle out after a few days and go from there. Uh, we're recording this at about 2.46 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, C. Uh, this was another one down in the hole in the 30s. It's doubled. Uh, but again, if you zoom out, it's just getting started. These type of things work higher. Uh, range resources we've talked about forever. This is now actually making, uh, gosh, eight-year highs. Uh, 2017, so seven-year highs now. It's breaking out to 37. We think fair value when we got, we got in. Uh, we've gone through this story a million times about being patient. Uh, but we got in down at 11, it shot up to 18, uh, it collapsed during COVID, we, we leaned in, brought our basis down to 410, and this thing is now ripping higher. Uh, but again, our estimation of proved and unproved reserve when we got in at 11, and then aggressively uh, added into in COVID and brought our basis down to 410 was that proved and unproved is worth about 60. So we're now starting to get closer and closer and we'll start to peel off accordingly as we get to that intrinsic value. And then we'll keep some on the house's money like we did with Intel and a couple of others uh, for the um, uh, free play to uh, you know fairly valued, fully valued, excessively valued. We wanna keep some in for excessively valued when everyone starts to see what we saw uh, years ago. Uh, here's the newest seasonality from Ryan Dietrich over at Carson Group. Oh, wait a second. We're, <laughs> we got more stocks to talk about. PayPal is starting to work higher, even in all this market weakness, up to 64. We'll see how uh, uh, Chris is um, uh, progressing on his goals for the turnaround. Again, new CEO. It just sits there until you get new information. Eager to see those earnings. Uh, the cruise lines are starting to come back. Uh, that was anticipated. 3M is working its way higher. Remember, we also have Solventum, so you have to add add that back because that that was the spin. But this is this chart is adjusted for it. So on an adjusted basis, it got down to 69. Now it's up to 91. So up about 50%, working its way higher. We like that recovery story, and we're keeping Solventum as well. The spin co. So when you add up the sum of the parts, I think. Looking a year, two years, three years out, it's going to wind up being uh, well more than a double, which will be exciting. Uh, KRE, the regional banks, we still like this. No change here, uh, even though we don't get a chance to talk about these things every single week. Uh, everyone's, you know, you got to follow in real time last year, the Intel trade from 25 and change to 48, kept going to 51 uh, without us. And then uh, now it's back to 35. So we still got a third of that. That's free house money. Uh, if it pulls in a little more, maybe we'll top up to that, but uh, we're, we're kind of happy with that. Hormel starting to blast higher all these dividend stocks. Uh, low 30s, now it's at 35 in just a month or two, which is good to see. That's just beginning. Canada Goose just sitting there. The name of the game with Canada Goose is going to be China. We saw Asia sales up 60% uh, last quarter, year on year uh, in Asia, meaning China. Today, we just saw Hermes knock it out of the park on their China sales. So I think that game is coming back on. This is languishing around our basis, around $11. Uh, and, um, and I think we're going to start to see more good news with that one. You saw the cuts during the quarter. You saw all the positive things that he's doing in accordance with the uh, long-term plan. Uh, Google is sitting here. They report tonight. Let's see what happens with that. Uh, my guess, given you know what we saw with Meta, they're going to say we have a lot of costs in AI. It'll pull back. We'll just suck it up. This is one we want to own for a while, and this is one we bought in you know fall of 2022, and again in March of 2023 when no one wanted them, well below 100, and now everyone wants them uh, much higher. 
uh, Generac, this thing continues to work higher, but you can hardly see it. It's just getting started from the 70s and 80s. Now it's 137. You can't even see it on the monthly chart. Why? Because it's just getting started. The orders are coming in. They work through the uh, the COVID uh, ordering. You saw the CEO on the claim and countdown talking about the power grid, how every AI search takes 17 times more energy than a Google search. Uh, and that story is just beginning. It will also benefit, obviously, Alibaba with their cloud service and compute services that they're offering and getting everyone hooked into their ecosystem by crushing their competitors on price, getting them into their ecosystem, and then over time, they'll just be able to sell them more and more and more compute power. Estee Lauder coming back again. This is no different than Hermes. This is no different than uh, Canada Goose, no different than Nike, no different than Starbucks, no different than Alibaba. It's a Chinese story. It's coming back. And then you've got uh, emerging markets, been grinding sideways here for a year and a half, getting ready to, to uh, take, take a move to the next level, contingent on the dollar, contingent on the Fed. Today, the inflation numbers were hot. You're saying, what do you mean the Fed? They're not going to do anything. Well, I think they're going to move ahead with the uh, balance sheet reduction, which will uh, create a compression in yields. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the inflation numbers, which we've covered in recent weeks as it relates to shelter, as it relates to uh, car insurance. Both, we think, are nearing the end of their elevated levels, and they are the meaningful weights. If you back those out, uh, you wind up with, uh, re you know, deflationary numbers is basically what it comes down to. Disney, again, <laughs> no one liked it when we were pounding the table in the 80s. Everyone loves it up at 112. Uh, everyone loved it at 123. Now it's back down to 112. Everyone's getting nervous. This is Disney. And this quote right here is why I wanted to bring this up about Disney. The young man knows the rules, but the old man knows the exceptions. And this is from Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'm going to repeat that again. The young man knows the rules, but the old man knows the exceptions. We haven't asked me anything question this week about Disney. And some guy is asking uh, or a viewer uh, is, is asking, you know, how can you even think about owning Disney at one hundred twenty dollars? Well, number one, we bought it uh, <laughs> a hell of a lot lower. But number two, uh, and and his claim is uh, net operating income and and free cash flow. And the rule is you want cash generative companies that are growing. The exception is when you have a business with no competitor like Disney and like Boeing, for instance, which just burned four billion dollars of cash. We're going to talk about that. Um, but they still have 5,600 plane backlog and they only have one real competitor. So when you know, as a young person, you know all the rules. Oh, it's it's short term negative cash flow. It's uh, stagnant revenues. But the old man has seen enough cycles and understands when a business has a true moat where you can make exceptions for super great high quality businesses that are in, uh, you know, once in a hundred year temporary impairments or once in a two decade temporary impairment. Last time Disney was like this was 84 when the Bass family got involved and made like, uh, I think it was 20 X their money. Uh, we've covered that in past podcasts. Uh, Comstock Resource working its way higher, even in the market weakness, pounding the table in the sevens and eights. Now it's at 10, 18 and working higher. But again, on this chart, you can't, it, it, it hasn't even begun, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be another range of resources. We're excited about it. Cooper Standard, again, information vacuum, no news in the last three months since earnings, other than the fact GM knocked it out of the park, Ford knocked it out of the park. We think that'll be positive for Cooper Standard. We'll see what the market environment is when they report, but all in happy. Uh, Crown Castle, okay? Uh, 80s and 90s, uh, um, uh, pounding the table. Elliot got involved after. Then it shot up to, I think it was like 110 or 115 when rates compressed at the end of the year. This is going to trade with rates. We believe this is a counter trend rally in yields that's going to be bought. The Fed is going to be the new buyer in the market in coming weeks. Uh, and on that basis, this is going to trade up along with TLT. So we're excited about that. City. Um, Mike Mayo was out yesterday morning saying it's going to double from here. Where was he at $43 when we were pounding the table? I, I don't know if he was. Yeah, I don't think he was interested. So hats off. Jane Frazier, I was skeptical of her. She's she's 
executing as it stands. She slashed and burned, cut a lot of people and didn't lose revenue. And this like Bank of America is a play on uh, the investment banking business coming back in spades. And we do believe that the risk appetite is going to be on. We're going to see more and more IPOs and these bigger banks are going to benefit. We chose City and um, uh, City and Bank of America in the hole uh, when no one wanted them. Uh, we passed on Wells Fargo. That was our 2020 play uh, in the pandemic low. We're, we've not been impressed with Charlie Scharf and JP Morgan just never got to a point where it was viable with an enormous margin of safety, uh, even though it's uh, perceived as best in class. Baxter, again, shot down to 30. It's now up to 40. It's working its way higher. This falls in the dividend bucket, which we're going to cover and uh, and is going to work higher. This also flushed out. This was on the GLP craze in the fall, and now it's uh, you know up some 25% and will continue to push higher. Bank of America, again, big move. Uh, from 25 to 37, but just getting started. If you zoom out a little bit, Alibaba, same grind sideways since March of 2022. Shoulder, head, shoulder, reverse uh, head, shoulders. We've gone through all the sentiment charts, and we're going to talk about some of the things that are happening with Chinese companies relative to U.S. companies. And uh, looks like we are at the inflection of a sea change, which is very exciting. You know, day to day, week to week. This felt like uh, chi literally Chinese water torture nonstop, but in the scheme of things, it's a very natural consolidation period of a year and a half to two years, and uh, and we're ready ready to move higher now. So, uh, Siri is listening to me and interrupting my podcast, so we'll just uh, turn her off for a second. Now, Boeing, uh, Boeing is um, uh, you know in the midst of everything. This is one of those stocks that. The hits just keep coming and there's no competition and they have a 10 year backlog. So you you buy in this range 150 to 200 over the next few years, uh, the thing will work its way back up to three, four, five hundred and uh, it'll be a good day. So this, again, is an example of, yeah, would we ordinarily buy a company that's negative free cash flowing and having all these problems? No. Is there a competitor to Boeing that's that can take their all their business? No. If, I'm, if I own an airline and I need planes, I can say, Boeing, you're a disaster. I don't want doors flying off in, in the middle of uh, 30,000 feet. Uh, I'm going to go to Airbus and Airbus says, oh, we'd love to have you. We're glad that Boeing's doing a terrible job and uh, you'll have your first plane uh, 20 years and two months from now. So the answer is that's not an option. Boeing will get a new CEO. They'll take over Spirit Aero Systems so they get rid of some of the uh, what they call uh, traveler work or something why they have travelers is beyond me but uh leaving that aside boeing will be fine uh amazon we're gonna find out my guess just giving the tenor of this it's a shoot first ask questions later so they'll report good numbers uh they'll say we have to spend money for ai the stock will go down and uh, we'll just sit there because we own it from October 2022 and March of 2023, and our basis is much, much lower, and uh, and this thing's up a lot. So um, that's just a normal thing. That will normally knock people out of the stock, a 20% pullback or whatever like that, but we don't really care uh, given our long-term view. And advanced auto parts, as much as this thing has flown from 50 back up to 80, and that now it's at 75, uh, again, the recovery is just beginning, and we've covered that in detail in recent podcasts. So this is the seasonality that uh, from Ryan Dietrich. The funny thing about these seasonality charts is that they always change them based on what happens in the rearview mirror. So like when when uh, the, the market was supposed to crash in uh, March and April, uh, everyone had one chart out, and now they've changed it to another chart. The point is, you know, you get some weakness in the first half of the year and then you get some weakness in the second half of the year and you usually finish strong. That's kind of the theme, election year or not. We're in that period of weakness. We think it's got another couple of weeks to go uh, and then um, we should get a summer rally. And then again, uh, some weakness before the election on the uncertainty and then a rally into year end once we get that certainty, regardless of who's elected, believe it or not. I know there are people on both sides listening, but I, the world, the sun will rise even if you're, adversary or, or the other side uh, is not elected. The, the world will be okay. So long as one party doesn't get all the power, we're gonna be just fine. Checks and balances, please. Uh, okay, 
Uh, Magnificent Seven earnings are expected to decelerate while the other 493 earnings are expected to improve. This is from Bank of America. And my buddy over there, you know who you are. Thank you for sending this stuff over every week and every day. Um, uh, and that's in line with our thesis we've been talking about. We'll just run through some of these. They are getting at levels where you could see an inflection, but uh, again, they also have more to go. This is the 10 day put call. Um, uh, let's see here, One NASDAQ 1% EMA, that's getting a little bit oversold, but could go further. So, you know, these are some of the things that we consider. Uh, we just, experience tells me there's probably gonna be a little bit more. I guess we either go back and retest that low or more likely what, what is uh, appropriate and happens frequently is uh, they'll take out those lows just to panic sell everyone, flush everyone out in a couple of days and then take it straight up when everyone's already out and in disbelief. So right now, People still want to buy these dips. They need to be punished. And um, uh, and, and that's what the market is doing. It's, it's looking to bring some uh, semblance. But, you know, you look at PMO by SPX. This is, you know, this is levels where you're favored to buy versus sell. And that's why we're seeing a, a handful of companies that we want to put money to work today, even, even with the view that uh, indices will probably go a little bit lower in the short term, and then we'll deploy the rest uh, uh, in following weeks uh, on that basis. But um, but the key is we resolve higher uh, into year end, and um, and we 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 get out of positions either when the thesis has changed, i.e., the underlying business fundamentals deteriorate worse than anticipated at the facts change, we change our mind or uh, when it hits fully valued, uh, you know, fair, we're always buying in despondency or undervalued periods. Uh, and then we look to start to lay off at fairly fully and excessively valued and usually in tranches. And we don't have, I mean, you know, Amazon and, and uh, Alphabet are maybe fairly valued in the near term. So in theory, you can make a case, which is why we did take off those uh, uh, Amazon options uh, about a month ago, but we kept the stock because uh, those were up multi-bagger. So, you know, it, it's, uh, here's a NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. So most of these are getting closer to oversold but they can also retrace. Here's um, NYSE McClellan summation index. This looks like it has a little bit more to go to the downside. The skew, which was uh, which was a key factor that we talked about for many weeks as we were putting on the hedges, um, that has that that implies you could have some more pain ahead uh, in the near term. VIX has spiked and starting to roll over. It could re-spike again, which would be normal. So it's kind of a mixed bag. The, the, com the companies we want to buy, I mean, and you see great, by the way, it's kind of almost comical. Um, I'm just trying to see over here to, yeah, yeah, this is funny. Alibaba, Dow's down 400 points. Alibaba is up uh, a half a percent. So Alibaba is the new safe haven. <laughs> you can't make this up. If you live long enough, you see everything. Alibaba is the new safe haven. That doesn't get any funnier than that. But if you look at the cash on the balance sheet and the and the shareholder yield from dividends and buybacks of 5%, why wouldn't Alibaba be your safe haven? Oh, and by the way, you got a triple upside on top of that, uh, you know, free 5% dividend yield. Um, Okay, energy is the only one. If you look at some of these, oh, I'm on the wrong tab here. Okay, we did that. So we're looking sector by sector now to see, is everything looking like it's completely oversold? This is bearish, bullish percent. I think this is a point and figure indicator. It's immaterial what it measures. What it measures is extremes. And um, you know we're not seeing on a sector basis most of these sectors at the extreme oversold where you have you know whatever it is 10 percent at uh on bullish percent buy signals uh communications is at 40 percent uh nasdaq at 45 percent so they're all kind of in middle of the road which is why i think we got a little more pain same as consumer discretionary at 50 percent energy's up so um I could possibly go a little higher. We only have Comstock as our exposure, and that's kind of an idiosyncratic play. 
Uh, financials are a little bit overdone. I would expect a pullback in, in City and uh, Bank of America in the short term. Uh, gold miners are a little overdone. Uh, don't tell the gold bugs that. They won't believe you. Healthcare is getting closer to a buy point. Dow is getting closer. But again, it's in the 50s, more room to work. Industrial, same thing. It's just coming off the boil. It doesn't mean it has to go down to 10. But that's where, you know, when it gets down to those extreme levels, you you know, it's just like close your eyes and buy. It's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, materials is only halfway down. NASDAQ is getting a little oversold here. So on a discrete basis, you can find some things to do. Uh, real estate is getting close to that level at 35. S&P not there yet. Staples not there yet. Uh, transport's not there yet. Utilities kind of also in no man's land. Uh, this is uh, from Bank of America. It's talking about um, value has, having more room to run. So they're calling for a regime change here from their lips to God's ears. But this is the one that we've covered before that I think is very important when you look at the Stanley Black and Deckers of the world, the three M's of the world, etc. Dividend yield is relatively inexpensive versus history. And you can see this all the way back to 2000. The last time you could buy dividend, a basket of dividend stocks this inexpensively uh, was in 2001 to 2003. And we've consistently covered the similarities of those periods repeatedly on this podcast. And uh, so, so that's where there's huge opportunity right now. Dividend yield is neglected by active managers. Um, small size is 43% underweight. So that speaks to small caps. This is all going to change when you get the Fed back in the market buying 40 billion or quote unquote reinvesting 40 billion dollars a roll off every month on the treasuries, um, which we covered with David and we covered also last week on this podcast. And I think there were a couple other charts in here I wanted to cover. Yeah, growth versus value expensive on book value. So you can see this is at a level that exceeds even 2000 when value outperformed dramatically from 2000 till 2007, basically. Uh, growth versus value, uh, expensive on a trailing EPS basis. Growth versus value elevated on a price to sales basis. Growth versus value elevated on a PE to growth basis. So it's all there, it's all setting up. And, um, and we don't make our decisions on the basis of these. We just like to see that the discrete companies that we've chosen to invest in because they have large margin of safety relative to their uh, normalized cash flow generation and growth levels uh, happen to fall into these buckets that are pointing at an at pointing to an inflection point. Value versus growth valuations remain almost two standard deviations below the average. So again, this gets back to 2001 to 2002 period before monster play, uh, and and that's the story. Was there anything else in this one? I think we're, yeah, I think we got all the ones. Uh, National Associative Active Investment Managers dropped down to 60% equity exposure. So they're all puking out. They, you know, they were at 100 at the top. They, they couldn't get enough equities now that we've pulled back. I think the, the S&P is probably down 7%. We had called for 3 to 8%. Uh, maybe we get a hair more. Uh, now they're puking out at, at or near the bottom. I think we got a little more to go to the bottom. By then they'll be at, you know, 20% equity exposure, and we will be uh, backing up the truck. So uh, bullish percent dropped down to 32%. We'd like to see this in the 20s. We'd like to see them, uh, retail investors, completely not bullish. All these readings are neutral right now. Neutral is not a level of fear where I get to be a, an aggressive buyer. It's where I get to be a selective buyer. Then this is a great article from Financial Times Alphaville, the team transitory. Uh, they say the chart below shows the various contributions and various components to annual U.S. CPI inflation. Shelter housing has been the driving factor into lesser extent transport. Both were behind the surprises in the month-on-month -month data across January, February, and March. They help make up the sticky services component. Housing costs are keeping inflation inflated. So you can see here in the chart, digging further, Shelter is itself driven by owner's equivalent rent of residence. This is the BLS estimate of what owner occupiers would pay if they rented their homes. It gets a clunky or chunky 
34% weight in core CPI. That's why I'm saying these two components, which excludes for, uh, food and energy. Motor vehicle insurance is driving the transport services bar. We covered motor vehicle insurance, I think with David, covered it last week on the podcast, and we've covered owner's equivalent rent. So uh, even if you're still wedded to CPI, it should come down. OER tends to lag private indicators of rent. See the chart below. Insurance also operates on rolling contracts right now. Auto insurers are perhaps pushing up premiums to make up for higher post-pandemic costs. Both should settle, but it will require patience. So he goes through these different charts. Uh, and we covered a little bit of the, the reasoning behind the auto, auto insurance, not dissimilar from the housing insurance spike in terms of supplies, cost of repairs, and um, uh, cost to service people with claims because you couldn't get them parts. You had to give them rentals longer uh, and not dissimilar to housing. You had to put people up in hotels, et cetera. Uh, this is an article from Jacob Sonenschein. Uh, EV woes crushed this lithium stock. Now it looks ready to rally. It's on Albemarle. We've covered that a bunch of times on our Ask Me Anything uh, question. We do like this one. We don't have a position yet, but we continue to look at it. I think it might be an Ask Me Anything this week as well. GM raises profit outlook for 2024 after strong first quarter earnings. We like the sound of that for CPS, Cooper Standard. Ford tops first quarter earnings estimates as commercial unit offsets EV losses. We like the sound of that. Uh, Goldman says we're still in phase one of AI stock market takeover. Here's how they expect phases two to four to play out. This is critically important. The second phase, uh, which uh, we, we believe we have the best value relative to price in the world to benefit from the second phase of the AI revolution, is uh, it says here, eventually Goldman expects other firms to benefit from the AI build out, though this isn't limited to just semiconductor producers or designers. Cloud providers, computer equipment makers, and security software developers will have a part to play. The cloud providers is gonna be the biggest. The, com the compute power, AWS is of the world, Azure is gonna do fine, uh, maybe Google will catch a couple crumbs, but the biggest one is going to be in Southeast Asia and China, which is going to be Alibaba, is going to capture all of that compute demand. And that's why they've been cutting prices in the short term to lock everyone into their ecosystem so they can benefit from that in the long term. And, uh, and that's going to be a big deal. Bullish Boeing analyst said he didn't expect things to start falling apart in midair. <laughs> if they get it right, it's an incredible opportunity. I'm not making light of that. That's pretty serious. But, um, you know, they'll, they'll get it right. I'm glad they, they're getting rid of Calhoun and uh, they'll get someone in there that'll get uh, that'll be exciting and they'll take control of Spirit Aero Systems, which is the fuselage provider that used to be part of Boeing. And there's huge upside because they're buying it in trough earnings period. And that's the case. And uh, this analyst had a 250 price target. I think that's modest, but they do 12 month price targets. So uh, we look we do. 24 to 36 month views. Boeing reports better than feared quarter, said, says supply chain is stabilizing amid 737 max crisis. So that's all good. Bank of America tops estimates on better than expected interest income and investment banking. That's the whole play with Citi and Bank of America is that uh, M&A, but more than that, new paper business gets crazy. Uh, good in terms of IPO supply, uh, debt refinancing, et cetera, once the Fed makes its move on uh, the happening of quantitative tightening. Hermes sees China sales jump, defying luxury showdown. That story is just beginning. Um, so this morning you had GDP came in lower than expected at 1.6% versus I think it was 2.5 on the backs of a uh, slower consumer spending. Uh, spending for personal consumption grew by 2.5% in the first quarter, a slowdown from 3.3% in the fourth quarter, according to the latest data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, purchasing of services increased by 4%. That was partially offset by a decline of uh, four tenths of 1% in goods consumption in the first three months of 2024. Healthcare services in particular saw a significant uptick. Um, gasoline energy saw a decrease in motor vehicles. Okay, well, that's not showing up in GM's and uh, uh, Ford's numbers. So 
Uh, Charlie Munger explained, if you want to become rich, stop trying to be intelligent and aim for not stupid instead. I would apply this to the current environment of people chasing shiny objects and now getting uh, bashed. You know, a good example is uh, Meta, which is a great business, will be fine over time. But if you remember on our podcast, you know, when no one wanted it in the hundreds and, and even down to 80, uh, and now everyone recently wanted it in the 400s. And of course, you chase the shiny objects. When everyone wants them, you get your teeth kicked in. And that's what happened to people last night. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see this weak tape and like a lot of our names up today, whether it's GXO, whether it's Alibaba, uh, Generac, all these boring companies uh that no one's interested in are, are getting a bit into weakness this this looks like a shift in um kind of a rotation that's that's coming that uh that is going to be pretty aggressive when it kicks into full gear uh okay strategist main upgrades uh strategist upgrades maintain hong kong's rise okay there's something I wanted to cover in here. All right, this is interesting. Uh, there was press on the $40 billion worth of local equity ETF buying from Central Hujin Investment, which is akin to China's sovereign wealth fund. Foreign investors were net sellers, mainland China. Uh, da, 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 da. So more and more... Bloomberg News is reporting that total mainland China equity ETF buying by China's sovereign wealth fund was at least $43 billion in Q1 of 2024 versus only $6.8 billion in the second half of 2023. This report does not touch on individual stock buying. Uh, does this scenario sound familiar? Hopefully Chinese stock will follow the same path as Japanese stocks, i.e. higher. So, uh, Brendan Ahern, who runs the K-Web uh, China Internet ETF uh, pointed this out in his letter, ChinaLastNight.com. And he's basically saying China is now following the Japanese playbook. Uh, Central Bank is, which is uh, buy bonds, buy equities, push the stock market up. And it's working. So uh, took him long enough. And here we go. Hong Kong stock surged by the most in three weeks as Chinese market regulators promise to support Promise of support lifts sentiment. Uh, here's from David Inglace. He's on Bloomberg TV. Chinese tech stocks soar. Uh, best week since 2022 reopening. Uh, China tops 200. MSCI China tops 200 day moving average for the first time in several months. First significant breakout this way. This year, a long way to go for sure. What's next? So that's good. Goldman Sachs says China stocks may rise by 40% on market reforms. Uh, as UPS, UBS goes overweight, Hong Kong shares. So sentiment is changing. We haven't seen these type of headlines in a while. Hong Kong stocks jump to five-month highs on earnings optimism as China earnings kick into high gear. Eager to hear uh, Alibaba's earnings this quarter. Hong Kong Hang Seng hits 2024 high as traders warm to, quote, uninvestable Chinese stocks. And finally... Uh, Hong Kong stocks hit five-month highs as fund positioning shows investors returning to China. Our article of the week, more work to do, stock market and sentiment results. Uh, this is a chart of NVIDIA. We think it's probably got a little more to go. It's interesting. I was at a social event and a friend of mine is a fund manager and he was pitching me on NVIDIA um, because it had pulled back from 974 to 875 and he said it was a great bargain at 875 so you know um you know th this is a it's kind of interesting that no one was telling me to buy it at 110 but everyone's telling me to buy it at 875 because it's a bargain down from 974. uh when i hear things like that even when it's from really smart people uh it it you know, it, just the experience of filters and triggers that tell me that things have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves. Um, so to get into the article, that's why I put that NVIDIA chart. We've got no direct position. We have an indirect position through the uh, 
SMH put spread. Um, so as I stated in recent weeks, we continue to maintain 100% of our tactical semiconductor short hedge and added a long bonds TLT call spread out of our derivative bucket. The combined positions have an expected uh, max value of between 5x to 8.45x. When we zoomed out, Weeks ago, it was our view that the semiconductor sector had gotten a bit ahead of itself in the short term. When everyone starts chasing the same shiny objects, pain is bound to come. It has. So we see here it dropped 17%. Now we got a counter trend bounce. Uh, I think we'll retest the lows and probably cut below it just to shake people out in the next week or two. And that should be it uh, before it finds some buyers. Uh, and then we just put in a couple clips from uh, March 5th when we were talking about the hedges. And then uh, we talk specifically about the semiconductor hedge on March 26th on Yahoo. You can watch those on your own. Uh, we covered David Lynn. We covered, uh, you can watch the Mike Mayo interview on City. And then the fear and greed. These are not extreme enough where it's an all in, close your eyes and buy. It's a selective buy space. We think we got a little more to work down. Uh, here was an unusual options activity today in Alibaba Group. Someone bought 10,700 contracts of the January of the December 2024 110 calls. So you're starting to see institutional money come in and uh, get get show some interest. We haven't seen that in a long time. Earnings top 30 weights of the financial sector uh, in the last 60 days. The earnings estimates have been re revised up two and a half, 2.59 percent for 2024, up 1.47 percent for 2025. Healthcare similar. Uh, more more muted story up seven tenths of one percent and down uh, four four tenths of one percent for next year. Uh, economic data. The big thing was the core PC, C, uh, PCE prices coming in hot. Again, um, uh, we covered that with the OER and the transport, which is insurance. And it's not just those two line items, it's the dramatic weighting of them in these indicators that is the factor. The reason the market sold off a lot today is on the one hand, GDP came in lower than expected, which is good, should increase the odds of a hike, uh, excuse me, should increase the odds of a cut. But then you got the inflation numbers and, it, and you know the market uh, reacted to um, well, they won't be able to cut if inflation stays high. But if you look under the hood and see the two heaviest weights having these lagged characteristics to them that are more than overdue to correct and correct hard, if you look at a month or two months, uh, then you can look through that. And that's why the odds of a cut in September went up today, not down. Um, and that was the, the key economic data. Earnings still holding in there, 243 for 2024, 276 for 2025. Okay, let's get to, uh, so the formal podcast is over. If you wanna stick around for the Ask Me Anything questions, please do. A lot of you get great value from that and I'm happy to do it. Bill McGrew asks, thanks for a great podcast. Been listening for years and tell everyone about it. Thank you, by the way. That's the most important thing you can do. Um, uh, if you're not a client and you want to give back, please uh, comment, click like, click subscribe on the YouTube channel. I do know a lot of you watch it uh, in the Hedge Fund Tips website, but if you click on the video itself, it will take you to YouTube. And then you can right here click subscribe, click like, and leave a comment. And the more people that do that, the more YouTube is gonna show it to people when they log into YouTube, people who have watched investing videos or business videos, uh, and that will help us to continue to grow. And it's working because we see the numbers are, are working, which is fantastic uh, and exciting, but um, nothing is better than a one-to-one. -one. You don't have to ref you know, uh, recommend it to 25 people, although we'd love if you did. But if just one or two good friends that you think would benefit, you know, and if you've been listening for a while, you know the value we, we deliver each week, uh, that would make a big difference. So if you care to share, how do you get to a valuation on Disney above 125 to 150, considering 40 billion in revenue they added in the last 10 years, 
has added zero in operating income. I've seen that before and it's never good. It seems like you need to make some pretty heroic assumptions uh, above improving profitability or valuation to get a high return. Fully acknowledge you bought well in the 90s uh, and in the 80s, by the way, uh, and a few uh, lower. But um, also, it's probably too early for you, but what's your opinion on CTLP? I think I covered the Disney thing. Uh, the big thing is going to be parks and experiences, massive investment, return on capital, uh, continued, you know, the competition in streaming is going away. They're going to be three, three or four left standing. They're one of them. Uh, they went through this in 1984 with stale parks and uh, um, trying to figure out how to resell their their valuable historic content library. They now have, the, you know, back then it was VHS and that drove them for 20 years. Now it's going to be streaming, which will drive them for 20 years. The cruises are humming. The parks they're reinvesting in. No one can compete. And this is not going to be valued the same as a regular no-name company that's just valued exclusively on short-term earnings power. People are going to give Disney the benefit of the doubt as long as they start delivering and uh, they are making headway. And I think the big thing will be uh, if you consider Value Act and what they did with both Spotify and with New York Times, which were left for dead, and really helped them around their streaming and subscription uh, execution. And it just changed the game for New York Times and changed the game for Spotify. Uh, you can see what happened. And they're going to do the same with Disney. I mean, look at this thing. Spotify was totally left for dead. Value Act got involved and they just completely ripped it. It's almost back up to new highs, which is mind boggling. Not many companies that were in that space are back up to their 2021 highs. Spotify is. And even New York Times, this sleepy old business, um, they completely turned it around. So uh, we think they're going to be very helpful uh, in that regard for uh, Disney. And, you know, the other thing you have to consider is you basically had three years with the thing closed. So you got to give them a little time here. Uh, revenues are up from 65 billion to 88 billion. That's not too shabby. Uh, and trying to think here. Free cash flow guidance, I think they gave us like six or seven billion, and it keeps going up because they slashed costs. It uh, slashed costs. Yeah, free cash flow. It had gotten down to two, $2 billion in 2021. Uh, last year it was $5 billion. They're going to be back up to $10 billion of free cash flow. So I don't really care much about uh, anything other than free cash flow. And this is moving in the right direction. Uh, I think it'll be at $10 billion probably three, four years out. And on that basis, it's cheap at 120 130 And I think the growth that will start to come back in with international expansion, with experiences, with more cruises, with everything that they're doing in the pipeline and the fixed cost in place for streaming that every incremental ad goes straight to the bottom line, I think is going to be a good scenario. And then finally, with people not going to the theaters, but getting used to paying $20 for a new release on you know Disney Plus or Amazon Prime, I think that's another uh, interesting trend for them. So, uh, Bill, we're, we're perfectly fine with it. Uh, uh, to your point, we bought it a lot lower, but we're going to be patient with this one and give it a lot of room, just like we can do with Amazon and Google, even though they're up a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, we're, we're in it for the long term. We just got lucky to have a generational buying time. And uh, when you get a generational buying time, you're not too keen to part with it. Uh, Jan Usi, any thoughts on carrying SA stock? Has a nice dividend, also chain Gucci's two third of their operating income. Uh, I think this is going to fall into that uh, goose tapestry, um, Estee Lauder bucket. China's coming back. So I know this one really got crushed a few weeks ago. Uh, 
Why is that not coming up? Did you misspell it? K E U R. Huh. Gucci parent. Caring, not two R's, one R. Um, but it, it, it also probably a lot like uh, Lulu, which we covered. Last week, similar story. So they've been stuck. Yeah, you know, the free cash flow has go, been going down. Let me just make sure this is the right one. Yeah, fashion. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, all right, so it's dropped from 80 down to 35. Let's see. The only thing that bothers me about this one. All right, so 13 to 17 to 16 to 20 to 21. So they're doing about 21 billion of revenues. Three shares that stain. They're holding the share count okay. What's the balance sheet look like? Four billion of cash. Twenty-seven billion dollars of debt. That's a pretty leveraged balance sheet right now. So I think that the market's probably a little bit worried about their ability to refinance and how quickly do the rates come down or at least um, come down a little bit. Let's take a look here. I mean, their net income though, I mean, it's basically been flat since 2019 and it's trading back to 2019 prices. So it's probably a little cheap. I, I wouldn't get too excited about this one yet, Jan. Um, it doesn't mean it won't work. It's just, it's, it's not for me. I did look at that when it fell like 20% in a day and I uh, can't remember the reasons I passed on it, but it's just not, blatantly obvious to me and um as a matter of fact i think we had oh okay now there was another quote from warren buffett about keeping your bat on the shoulder and that's what we'll do with that one uh matt leblanc oh from friends okay uh, hello. <laughs> I doubt it. I was wondering what you thought of the Lithium Play Albemarle. I also had an idea for the website. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't play commodity stocks in general. Um, I let, we, we've covered this one like a few times. It's getting more interesting. At 100, I'd probably just close my eyes and buy it. Um, you know, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I'd feel safer buying Albemarle than I would buying an EV company. It's kind of a backdoor way to play it as well. Um, let's take a look. But yes, it's getting close to the point where I'm getting very, very interested. It's not quite there, and I'm perfectly happy if it takes off without me because uh, it's a commodity stock. But at some point, these things, you know, you don't get many opportunities to buy them at these levels. And this is one of those times. And um, it's not going unnoticed. It's just not time to do anything yet for us. So um, negative free cash flow. So I want to understand why that's turning around. I understand the EV story, but there's got to be more to it than that. I also don't like this since 2018. One, two, three, four. Five, five out of six years, it's been negative free cash flow. That's that's a red flag for me. Um, 
it's not a super business. That's why it's really it's really got to come down for me to even get interested. And even when I get interested, I'm probably going to pass because it's a commodity company. Uh, and the only one that we have, we'll do energy from time to time when it's just so cheap, like we did in 2020. And in the case of Comstock, was a discrete situation with natural gas. Uh, but um, recently, but uh, not yet for this one for us. Vojislak Milutinovic. Uh, love the pod. What do you think about HelloFresh? Uh, meal kits. Dominating category. No one can compete with them at scale. Ready to grow their business called Factor. I use Factor, by the way. Um, ready to eat business. I don't think it's a good business. It's just because I like the product doesn't mean it's a good business. Um, let's take a look at the financials though. So they've done some acquisitions along the way. Let's see, share count keeps going uh, up, but it started to come in a little bit. That's good. Let's see how the synergies are going with free cash. All right, so free cash flow peaked in 2020 when I guess everyone was doing the meal kits from home went negative last year and started to recover a little bit this year. Um, G okay, I can't see it there. Let's just see it here. Wow, that's come down a lot. Uh, buying back shares, buying back. Uh, growth range up to 26%. Uh, I don't like this business, Vojislav, but I do like the numbers that I'm seeing, so I'm gonna look at it more carefully. Uh, I think, I think I'm probably gonna wind up passing despite how cheap it's gonna be. But I, I do think there's a there's probably a beautiful trade in here for like a two or three bagger really quickly. I don't know about the durability and that's where I'd have to get under the hood, listen to eight or nine conference calls, understand the, the client growth trend, cost of acquisition per client, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm noticing with factor uh, just myself is the price is going up and the portions are going down uh and you know it's starting to get to like 20 25 dollars a meal for like it's not which is fine i mean if you go out it could be 50 dollars a meal but i mean it's um it's good it's not great so i i would say like i i would say on a weekly basis i think about canceling it uh, and I have canceled it before, got off for a few months, and then, you know, et cetera. Uh, um, I'm going to look at it. I think it's okay. I think it's priced in a lot of bad news. Oh, let me take a look at the balance sheet. Like, why is this thing, like, so pounded? All right, so it's got a half a billion of cash. Yeah, balance sheet looks good. Huh. I think you might have something here, Vojislav. So I'm going to dig a little deeper. You should do the same. And that might be a secular trend with millennials or Gen Z people. I'm not sure, but uh, I'll look into it. But, you know, I know the Blue Apron sucked wind. You know, they had a ton of them during COVID and they all they all got roasted. 
Uh, but maybe this is the last man standing and they're going to kind of have a moat uh, on the business. So we'll see. Andre Berg, why is no one trying to buy Cooper Standard acquisition candidate? Any thoughts about Q1 results? Keep up the great work. Number one, you don't know if anyone's trying to buy it or not buy it. Um, you know, one of the things that um, the worst thing that could happen to us in the Cooper Standard investment would be that someone buys it. Because if they were to buy it now, they'd probably buy it for 20 or 25 bucks a share and um, basically robbing us from all the upside to 70 and beyond, because on a normalized basis, we still believe this can earn seven bucks a share a few years out. Um, and I actually um, voiced that concern very early on when I got involved uh, that, you know, uh my my core hesitancy was that the board was going to do a stupid deal like Teneco did and rob the shareholders out of a hundred dollars of upside and um what i could glean is that they they number one one of the reasons i got involved with it was that management owned a lot of stock number two they respected equity uh and number three the best i could glean is that uh they thought about their business in a similar way as I did. And you can get that from listening to their calls every quarter. So uh, the last thing you want to see happen, Andre, is that Cooper Standard gets bought because it's going to steal 50 to $75 uh, per share out of out of, uh, out of of my pocket and my client's pocket, uh, which is uh, would be unacceptable and uh, very disappointing. But it would still be a five bagger. So, you know, it's not not the end of the world. Um, okay, next, Ray Catrib. I've been a listener for three months, really love your show. Well, welcome, Ray. Yeah, you're, you're brand new. I'm excited to have you on board. It's my second AMA question for you. Turnarounds are event-driven investments and seem to have some qualitative aspects to them. Do you use a stock screener to find some of these turnaround candidates? Answer is no. We just pay attention to everything that's going on every day. Um, you know, I post the, my reads every day, things that I'm paying attention to. Uh, that's all public information that you can uh, benefit from. Uh, I look for stocks that are down and I look to determine whether they're temporarily impaired or permanently impaired. That's kind of our knitting. Uh, so what are the, and then we just play the time arbitrage game because when they're down enough and they're trading significantly below their intrinsic value uh, and the margin of safety is great, we've done all of our work. We can't control how quickly it's, reverts back to, uh, you know, two bagger, three bagger, four bagger, what, what, whatever it happens to be, we can't control that timeline, which is why we don't own one stock. We usually own eight to 12 concentrated portfolio. And some happen much faster than we anticipate, like the Rolls Royces, like the Intels, like the Vornados, like well, last year you saw them all. Um, and some take longer than expected, like the Babas, uh, et cetera. But that's why you have 8 to 12, because if you're not on meaningful leverage, uh, then you're just playing the time arbitrage game. And some will, will reach full value in 12 months or 18 months, and some will take three years or four years. But on balance, if you're getting that double or triple in a reasonable amount of time, your IRRs are meaningfully above the S&P net of fees, uh, and you don't lose clients, and, and, uh, and you gain clients, and uh, things continue to grow. And that's exactly what we do. So... Um, uh, so we don't use a screener uh, or imagine some of the filters such as forward PE. We never even look at forward PE. Uh, I mean, we look at it, but it plays no bearing uh, in, in how we're thinking. We're focused on can they compound capital at a reasonable rate? And are we buying it meaningfully enough below trend that that reasonable rate uh, as it normalizes back to trend becomes an abnormally high rate? So it may compound capital at eight to 12 to 14%, but we're buying it uh, down, you know, 50 or 70%. So we're effectively getting like a 30% compound back to trend. Uh, and um, uh, that is sufficient. And then, uh, and then it tends to overshoot on the upside in euphoria, just as it overshoots on the downside in despondency. And that's what we do rinse and repeat. And, um, and there you go. Bond futures, Fookers, any thoughts on Boeing debt potential issue and was downgraded? 
Uh, now they've got 5,600 plain uh, backlog, 10 years of clients. They'll work it out. Not a big deal. I wouldn't buy the debt because why would I, why would I want to own the debt? I mean, Boeing's equity is not getting wiped out. That's you. It. it I mean, Calhoun. A, <laughs> recent leadership has worked overtime to try to destroy the equity. Uh, they haven't succeeded, and that that's the beauty of owning a business that even a ham sandwich could run, as Buffett says, because one day a ham sandwich will run it, and we've seen that uh, in the last. Uh, two um, iterations of Boeing, but it's a moated duopoly business. So it will work out, the free cash flow will come back and all will be great. And all for all the people downgrading in the hole, you know, they got to write something every day, otherwise they don't keep getting their paycheck. So they just like, uh, they can't upgrade it when, the, when, you know, doors are flying off the plane. So they downgrade it to keep their job. And then when it doubles, they'll upgrade it again. It's no big deal. John Sever. Uh, appreciate the great content. Wanted to hear your opinion on Spirit Airlines. The current valuation, obviously risky, but the balance sheet uh, just seems cheap to me. Uh, yeah, this is a gamble. I mean, there's a decent chance they could go bankrupt, as we've seen. I wouldn't take it. I think if if anything else, it's a gambling trade and size it accordingly. Uh, they've got a very leveraged balance sheet, and it's... Uh, you know, if you're right, you can make a quick three bagger. And if you're wrong, you get a donut hole. So you decide if that asymmetry is right for you and size it accordingly. But um, super leveraged demand is going to continue to grow. Maybe if you get, by the way, I mean, the other thing is if they've got enough cash to make it to the election and you get a, a regime change and Lena Khan is out, then maybe they get bought out and you know you make some money that way um uh i was surprised they shut that down because i mean we can i mean all the bad, all the airlines you know the the old joke what's the quickest way to become a millionaire start as a billionaire and buy an airline company i mean all of them are over leveraged so it's almost almost a waste of time to look at the balance sheet it's not going to tell me anything i don't already know but um So you got a billion of cash. You got three billion of debt. And you got a half a billion of negative free cash flow. And you've had negative free cash flow every single year except for 2019. I think the writing's on the wall unless they get bought out and, and uh, it appears impossible for them to get bought out before the election. So. Do they have enough cash to make it to December, number one? And number two, then you're gambling on who's going to get elected and no one knows. So uh, this is this just goes in the hard pass file, but I understand what you're thinking, John. I, I just think that that is an example of trying to get rich quick and it usually doesn't end well. So I would avoid even if it works uh, because over a series of events if you keep taking that bet eventually the grim reaper is going to catch up with you <laughs> so <laughs> leave it at that with everyone uh we'll see be back next week same time same place in the meantime make it a great one bye for now